Good morning. I'm Mary Sue Sweeney Price, the director of the Newark Museum, and it is an honor for our museum to share this exhibition with our colleagues in these esteemed museums across the country. It is wonderful. Uh, the geographic spread uh, that this exhibition will have, not quite the geographic spread of Islam, but we're, we're large enough. Um, I'm often um, asked to, uh, to speak to groups on, on the issue of who owns culture. Uh, and perhaps all that can be said here um, is that many Western museums, those of us in this room, Newark certainly among them, are in the, uh, are in the forefront of this group, are beginning to confront this question by engaging cultures. And I thought if I gave you a quick demographic portrait of, of Newark and metropolitan Newark, uh, New Jersey, um, it might uh, be a little helpful in sketching out why it makes so much sense for beauty and belief to travel to our museum. We are the third oldest major United States city. And our Brigham Young, admittedly on a much smaller scale, was a man named Robert Treat, who brought uh, the Puritans out of Connecticut, where apparently they did not have enough religious freedom, to New Ark, uh, which is where they established a place to foster their belief, a literal reading of the New Ark. Uh, once Newark was, in fact, the nation's major manufacturing center, uh, and its, its uh, population really reached its apogee in um, the early 20th century. We were home to an enormous influx of Germans in our jewelry trade. Um, over 40% of our population was German, Italian, and Eastern European. The thriving Jewish communities of Newark have been well documented in the novels of Philip Roth. Also, manufacturing gave rise to the great migration of the American, uh, from the American South of African Americans who were looking for better lives and better jobs in the North. And we had a large influx of Puerto Ricans and now other Latinos. In fact, I have to say I felt very much at home. Um, and I want to again thank Ed Lind for picking me up out of the jaws of the airport and delivering me here this morning at the last minute. Uh, but I saw the beehive uh, symbols on, on your interstates. And of course, the same beehive is Newark, New Jersey's uh, emblem at the center of its coat of arms. Uh, emblematic of a town that was industrious, hardworking, immigrant stock, people who had to sacrifice a bit to get there and to make sure that the next generation of their families had a better life than their own. Um, today, we are an enormous center of 20th and 21st century migration. New groups of Latinos, Mexicans, West Africans have made our city rich with culture, but key to today's discussion is the fact that New Jersey is in the top three states in size of its Muslim population. The Newark Mu Museum, in fact, is uniquely situated just a short drive from the main centers of this population in New Jersey, which according to the 2000 census, our, um, uh, our city of, um, or actually our county of Passaic, which is just north of the museum, is the second largest Muslim population in the United States after Dearborn, Michigan. I'd also like to mention that the Newark Museum is situated in the heart of the city's universities. We are literally uh, not part of Rutgers Newark, but we are on the campus of Rutgers Newark, which is a 10,000 student population, which US News and World Report has identified for something like six straight years as the most diverse campus of any major, muse, uh, any major university in the United States. And I have to say the uh, student body of Rutgers as well as that of UMDNJ, our medical school and our uh, Institute of Technology just up the street. Um, it has uh, a large proportion of Muslim students who are, um, have really helpful student organizations that have always reached out to the museum looking for enrichment and um, involvement in, um, in our mainstream culture uh, such as we, we present it. Um, this is a very rich campus on which to paint our uh, canvas, on which to paint our exhibitions. And I'd like to um, explain um, about a few key collections and exhibitions which perhaps ex uh, give the background about why we uh, 
felt, again, this exhibition was so meaningful. Um, our director, John Cotton Dana, who was largely responsible for the formation of the new museum, the American Museum, the Museum of Utility and Use. He was a progressive, if there ever was one. Uh, in 1909, he declared that a museum object would have be of no value uh, if it were not of use, and he meant in educational purposes. He himself traveled to North Africa in 1916, 1924, and 1929. Clearly, North Africa, um, as well as Japan, was a, a particular uh, passion of his traveling in that area, and brought back um, the beginnings of our, uh, of our collection of Islamic works, which we have always seen as um, the Islamic bridge, to use um, the construct that you have both used. Uh, between our um, very large and significant African uh, traditional and contemporary African art collection, which includes contemporary Islamic inspired North African artists, so I'm very excited about that, um, and uh, a bridge to our large and uh, important Asian collections. The Asian collections bear a brief mentioning because we do have a history of presenting devotional culture. And I believe that probably stems from um, the existence of a consecrated Buddhist altar uh, on our campus, the centerpiece of our Tibetan art collection, which is one of the largest and best documented um, and most diverse in terms of both um, uh, objects of devotion and objects of daily life. Uh, the altar um, actually was moved from an original spot, so an old altar in Buddhist tradition is buried within a new altar, and it was consecrated uh, by His Holiness the Dalai Lama on the third of his four visits to the Newark Museum. His last visit this past summer uh, was to celebrate the centennial of our Tibetan collection and to take part in a peace and reconciliation conference in the city of Newark. And with all of the groups we have, that was a very resonant conference. I'd also like to, um, I could go on and on about the exhibitions of devotional culture that we have mounted um, with Bengali folk art, uh, the art of the Virgin in Portugal and the Portuguese diaspora, um, uh, African traditional religions, uh, Shango worship, um, but I, I, I will not um, bore you with all of that, but just to, to let you know that this is a, a meaningful tradition for the Newark Museum. But I thought I would end with a brief description of the Garden of Remembrance. Um, one of the major foundations in New Jersey, the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, um, asked each of its grantees um, following um, the September 11th um, tragedy whether we would um, consider doing an act of peace and reconciliation within our mission um, that they would fund. And what we did was to transform the Engelhard Court of the Newark Museum into the Garden of Remembrance, a memorial to September 11th. It, of course, was a garden of medieval Spain from the period of Convivencia, when the three monotheistic faiths, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, lived together on the Iberian Peninsula in a humane and creative society. Um, Convivencia meaning living together. The garden was conceived of, and um, you can only imagine how hard this was to do, in the middle of an art gallery, a setting of orange and palm trees with a bubbling fountain at its center and turtle doves cooing from the ornate cages. A list of distinguished consultants from academia and religious leaders and their designees willingly served as our advisors and helped us put together the opening ceremony. Um, much as so many hands have worked to put together this press conference, but I was absolutely terrified because the doves didn't coo. They just didn't want to coo. And I, I thought we went to all this expense to create um, something beautiful and memorable and a key element is not happening. Well, um, it was decided amongst the religious leaders that the ceremony should begin with a call to prayer by Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf. Imam Rauf came up to the the lectern and began his call to prayer. And the doves started singing for the first time. And we were all totally struck with the beauty and the solemnity and the meaning of the moment and the importance of living together. 
uh, in a humane and creative society. So all of the museums before you today, I know, are pledged to that, and we certainly are. And we were delighted when we were offered the opportunity to take this exhibition, and I have no doubt that it will be enormously successful, surrounded by many educational programs, and one that um, we will long remember in our institutional history. So we, we thank you, Sabiha, for conceiving of it and bringing it to us.